We start with some breaking news. The man accused of assaulting women in Manitou Park has been arrested. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Crimson News at 5. I'm Mark Hanrahan. And I'm Whitney Ward. So here's what we know right now. 26-year-old Devante Hardin was arrested today with assistance from the Office of Special Investigations at Fairchild Air Force Base. And according to Spokane Police, Hardin is a member of active duty military personnel there at Fairchild. He's now being charged with two counts of fourth degree assault with sexual motivation. That is a gross misdemeanor that carries a maximum of up to one year in jail. Spokane police say they have no reason to believe there are any additional suspects that were involved in this case. But this is still a developing story, so we'll continue to update you as soon as we have more information. More breaking news tonight as we now know the names of the two police officers who fired their guns, killing a man they say was holding a knife to a baby. It happened earlier this week near Chief Gary Park in North Spokane. According to court documents, the officers tried to de-escalate the situation, but the man ran upstairs with the baby. Police then shot him and that man later died. The baby was not hurt. The two officers who fired their weapons are identified as Corporal Brandon Lynch. He's been with SPD since 2013. He's been a marksman with the Spokane Police Department since 2020. The second officer is Corgan Mahandro. He's also been with SPD since 2013. He is a firearms and less lethal instructor. In other news, with Omicron spreading so rapidly in the inland northwest, more options for COVID testing are now available. Two new testing sites are open in Spokane this week. But these sites are not like the sites that we have seen here over the last few years. Tonight, our Cody Proctor is at this new Mead location to explain how things are going to be running a little differently. Cody? Well, Mark and Whitney, this new COVID test trailer actually opened up about an hour ago. And when we first got here, we already had a line for that testing trailer and still there is a line even this evening with people coming in to get those tests taken for tonight here at Mead Union Stadium. And it turns out that getting a test is pretty simple. All you have to do is come up to the trailer and grab a test. Now what makes this site different is that it is both a walk up and drive through test site. The video that we're going to show you is from the company Curative who made the trailer teaching you how to swab yourself. Now, Curative Regional Director Elizabeth Bayardi says these tests are a self-collected nasal swab with Curative guiding them through the process. We can actually see them doing that process right now and guiding people through it. Curative and the Spokane Regional Health District worked together to get these, get two of these sites up and running here in Spokane County. This site was a priority from Spokane Regional Health District based on the patient population and the need for testing in this part of the county. Downtown Spokane, as you can imagine, is very highly populated. There are a lot of patients who are experiencing homelessness, and so they wanted a spot where patients could walk up, get tested um, at very easily. Now, the testing trailer here that we are at tonight at Mead Union Stadium will be open until 8 tonight. After that, hours will be it'll be open Wednesday through Friday from 4 to 8 p.m. And on Saturdays and Sunday from 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, appointments can be scheduled online with Curative or at the site as well. Now, the second testing pod will be in the parking lot of the Dennis Murphy Chaz Clinic in downtown Spokane. That opens up tomorrow and will be a walk up clinic only. It'll be open Tuesday through Friday from 9 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon as well as a Saturday from 9 till 4 p.m. Reporting in Spokane, Cody Proctor, Crime 2 News. All right, Cody, thank you very much. More Washington National Guard members arrived at Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center this morning. Providence reported that 20 members of the Washington National Guard and one liaison are now at the hospital. Initially, they had reported there were 10 Guard members there. Providence says the National Guard members are working day and evening shifts on the campus there. They are helping in the emergency department, assisting with caregiver COVID-19 testing and caregiver mask testing, among other duties. Governor Jay Inslee spoke today about bills he's signed into law and the current state of the pandemic here in Washington. He says current modeling suggests that Western Washington may actually already be past the Omicron peak and back on the decline. However, when it comes to Eastern Washington, the governor says projections show we have not reached our peak yet, which means cases will likely continue to increase and that could cause hospitalizations to rise as well. Governor Inslee said the state is still in a precarious position and he voiced hope that once the decline in cases does start, that it will happen quickly. We hope that we will experience what other countries have experienced, that we will see a rapid decline, almost as rapid as the increase that we have experienced. But we cannot let our guard down.
Governor Inslee also said the state is working on getting more COVID-19 at home tests for the state's free testing kit program. So far, he said the state has sent out 1.4 million at home tests. Well, Governor Jay Inslee also signed a series of bills today, one being the delay of that controversial long term care payroll deduction. The state Senate voted overwhelmingly to postpone that tax for another year and a half. It was supposed to take effect January 1st, but will now be delayed until July of 2023. State lawmakers brought the deduction about because not enough people were saving for long term care, which does cost citizens and the state more in the long run. However, the plan was criticized for numerous issues, including how hard it was to opt out of so lawmakers agreed to delay the bill to fix the problems. I've heard um, that we shouldn't pass this uh, law at all, and that we should repeal it, but that's simply going down a path we already know leads nowhere. We've been down that path for years. Now, some of the people who may be exempt under the new version of the bill are those who work in state but live out of state, disabled veterans and military spouses. All right, let's move to our other top story today, which is the sunshine that <laughs> finally made a comeback to the Inland Northwest today. Rightfully a top story, I would say. We want to turn things back to meteorologist uh, Michelle Boss to talk about how long the sunshine is going to last. I mean, obviously the sun's not going to be up for very much longer. <laughs> what about tomorrow? I don't think it's going to be quite as sunny tomorrow, but I don't think the fog is going to be quite as dense as it has been over the past week. Of course, this past month has uh, had a lot of foggy days, and uh, I think we're ready to move on to February and maybe start seeing a little bit more sunshine. But we're enjoying it right now. Uh, we are past sunset by about 15 minutes, but those days do continue to get longer. Satellite and radar showing not everybody in the inland northwest got to enjoy the sun today. You can see that patch of uh, clear sky from Spokane and uh, due north and also across Coeur d'Alene. The plus uh, cleared out just briefly this afternoon, but across central Washington uh, from Colville down to Moses Lake down to Walla Walla, even towards Lewiston, uh, they were stuck in the low clouds all day. Temperature wise, the sunshine helped boost our temperatures above freezing this afternoon, but we're back down to 29 degrees in Spokane, 32 in Coeur d'Alene, upper 20s and lower 30s across the rest of the region. It does look like we are going to see an increase in clouds overnight. Some patchy fog possible once again with temperatures in the lower 20s and looking at uh, dry weather for Friday and Saturday, but the return of a little bit of snow on the way for the second half of the weekend. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. And now to our continuing coverage of the victim impact statements, which have been read here for most of this week on the Freeman High School shooting as the court is getting ready mm -hmm. to sentence that shooter Caleb Sharp. Now, in the first two days of these victim impact statements, which were Monday and Tuesday, the court saw kind of a mix of both Zoom and in-person statements. Today, though, they saw much more of those messages being delivered in person. Yeah, Crep News' Kyle Simchik was at today's hearing. He joins us live at the Spokane County Courthouse tonight with more on how today's proceedings went. Kyle? Well, just about every victim that spoke today asked the judge to put the gunman behind bars for life because they have to relive what happened every day for theirs. All right. Students and parents filled the bench on the prosecution side. The only people sitting behind the Freeman shooter were the detention deputies that walked him in. Sharp's family was not present. In the third day of victim impact statements, Judge Michael Price heard more testimony from students who say the only reason they're here today is because the rifle jammed. I had made eye contact with him after the first shot was fired into the crowd from his handgun, and it was a look of evil. A look that said he knew the harm these shots were causing and didn't care. You may think that you've got what you wanted, but I assure you that every single person you hurt is stronger than you could ever be. This student says she forgot what happened after the first gunshot because she was frozen in fear. A classmate had to drag her to safety. She says it was hard to leave that classroom even when deputies told them it was safe. I pleaded to not have to leave that classroom, to not have to see it, not to see what been done. The court also heard from a Freeman paraeducator who had known Sharp for years. I frequently worked with Caleb from the time he was in the first grade up to the day that he chose to murder his fellow classmates. I never saw a hint of the evil that must be present to perpetrate the crime that he committed. When a parent took the stand, she broke down in tears, recalling the fact that even though her son was in danger, he was still worried about her safety. This is the message her teen sent to his father. No, Dad, tell her not to come. <laughs> Don't know. If he acted alone. That mother, like so many others, raced to Freeman High School that day. There's still a sound that haunts her. 
the unforgettable scream of a mother who just learned the fate of her son. Victim impact statements continue next week before Caleb Sharp is sentenced. Reporting from the Spokane County Courthouse, Kyle Simchuk, Krem 2 News. All right, Kyle, thank you very much. And continuing with the Freeman statements, one Freeman student remembered talking to Sam Strahan about a math assignment that morning, and shortly after that conversation, she said she heard gunshots. Strahan was a sophomore. He was killed in that shooting. She says when she and her friends looked up, they saw Sam talking to Caleb briefly before Caleb shot him. This is her account of what happened next. That image is one I still suffer from extreme nightmares to this day. Caleb turned towards the three of us with the gun still in his hand and pointed it at us, but continued to turn without firing. My first instinct was to get my two friends into safety, and so I pushed them into the biology classroom. Once I knew my two friends were in the classroom, I started continuing towards the stairs when my teacher, Ms. Nelson, grabbed me and pulled me into her classroom. So that student told the judge that she will carry the images, smells, and sounds of that day with her for the rest of her life. Several other students also shared their own accounts of what happened that day, and we'll have more from them tonight on Crime 2 News at 6. All right, still ahead tonight, a Spokane City Council member stirring up controversy by refusing to wear a mask at City Hall. After the break, how the city plans to address the violation in the workplace.